uh, based here at UCL, and I work on various aspects of human evolution. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the origins of something um, that sounds a bit generalized, but actually has a very specific meaning in archaeology, and that's the origins of modern human behavior. Now, uh, many of you will remember um, Stanley Kubrick's uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, and in the opening scenes of that film, we're treated to what we're told is the dawn of man. And at this point, we're told that, uh, here we go, that um, our reasonably pursuit ancestors were hanging around at some point in the past on the savannah, doing not a lot really except picking up bits of food, when a black monolith arrived that we later find out came from Jupiter. And this made some humming sounds and some vibrations and so on. And somehow it instilled in our ancestors the ability to design and make tools. Now, obviously, being able to make tools is critical in our evolution. And according to this film, we're told that from this, it's a relatively small step to space travel and so on. And all it requires is some kind of black monolith from Jupiter. And it gets it stores us into our minds this idea that there's this kind of flicking of a switch, that it's just this suddenly happened to us, that suddenly we became these sentient thinking beings that we are today, as opposed to something that was pretty much like a chimp. Now, while clearly that's fiction, in reality, we do know from the archaeological record that something very similar did happen. We know that there's a point in our past when we start inventing much, much more complex technologies. And we call this the Upper Paleolithic Transition, or in Africa it's called the Late Stone Age. Now, this, now this, this appearance of modern human behavior, this is what we call modern human behavior, is associated with a whole package of new technologies. Up to that point, as far as we can tell, there were just stone tools, very basic stone tools, and then some rather pretty ones, but they were all very basically just stone tools. At this point, at this origins of modern human behavior, suddenly there's an explosion in the types of tools that we make. We start using bone and antler. We start making things like needles, harpoon points. We see the first um, blip, um, the first uh, body decoration in, in the form of shell, shells and ivory and so on that have been threaded to wear around the body. And, and body paint like ochre and so on. And we see advanced hunting technologies like spear throwers. But perhaps most dramatically of, of all, with this package, we see the first um, the first art. And it's very difficult to look at this kind of art and not to convince yourself that the people that made this, this art were basically thinking in the same way as us. It's impossible to think of, a, of some kind of uh, uh, advanced chimp doing this kind of work. And there's a lot of, a lot of it is very familiar today, even down to the portable um, pornography that they produced. Now, at the time, there were actually a number of different human species around. Now, just to put this in time, in, in, in perspective, so we started making stone tools around two and a half million years ago. But without wanting to be expensive to our um, more hairy ancestors, those tools were rubbish. I mean, they were the same rubbish from about a million years. They were essentially just shaped pebbles. And then a little bit later, we started making somewhat prettier tools. And that lasted for about another 1.4 million years. It's just the same old stuff, nothing really going on. But in that time, a lot is happening to our brains, and yet our technologies aren't really changing. But it's only in the last 50 to 100,000 years that we see this burst in technology, this modern human behavior. And it's practiced as well, there are at least three, five species around at the time that that behavior um, uh, uh, came in or appeared. But as far as we can tell, only one of those five species, i.e. us, actually produced this kind of stuff. Maybe these guys produced a little bit, we're not sure, but really most of it is only associated with us. And so this leaves a number, and it's also, the, another odd thing about the appearance of this modern human behavior is it's not, it doesn't appear when we appear. So our species, modern humans or homo sapiens, 
We appear in different parts of the world at different times. But the appearance of this behavior doesn't appear when we appear. Sometimes it does. So in Europe, we get to Europe, it appears. In other parts of the world, people get there, but it doesn't appear until much later. And also in Africa, it's very strange because obviously we're an African species, and we've been as a species for around 200,000 years, but this kind of technology appears around 80 to 100,000 years ago, and then it just disappears before coming back somewhat later. And it's probably the most famous site for this in Africa is a site called Rombos Cave. And here we can see, this is actually the first ever symbolic uh, uh, behavior we have any evidence for at all. This is actually an abstract pattern on a piece of ochre. But at the same time, we see things like needles and also the old Stone Age bling, these uh, threaded shells and some of this body decoration. So this throws up a whole bunch of questions, a whole, that we can't, that it's not really clear what the answer is. So, did we have the brains to do that kind of stuff long before we started doing it, or did we get the brains to do it when it appears? It does it appear because we suddenly become that much smarter. And if that's true, it's a bit odd, because why does it appear after our species appears in different parts of the world? And fundamentally, we really have to ask about the brain and about the evolution and the growth of the brain to address these questions. And this is where it gets very odd, because as I mentioned before, we started making our stone tools around two and a half million years ago, and not much happened really. It didn't really improve very much at all. But in that time, our brain started getting bigger and bigger, and more or less doubled in size. But it wasn't, by the time we started with this modern human behavior, this, uh, you know, this real art and all this complexity, our brains had actually overshot. So our brains were bigger then than they are today. So we actually got smaller brains than we had 50 or 100,000 years ago. So quite clearly, there's a strong decoupling of brain size from these expressions of our, these expressions of modern human behavior. And in fact, I hope to convince you that it's not all about brains. In fact, in many senses, it's a bad idea to have a big brain. Being, being smart is actually quite a stupid thing to be. And here's one reason. So we try to kill our mothers when we're born. Now, if you're a chimpanzee and you're looking forward to giving birth, you haven't really got too much to worry about. But if you're where well, you can see the problems. Okay, and in fact, even in hunter-gatherer societies, up to 30% of female deaths are down to childbirth and childbirth-related activities. Also, the brain is an extremely expensive organ to carry around. It's only 2% of our body mass, but it accounts for more than 20% of our energy budget. And what's more, that's obligatory. You can't downregulate. You can't switch your brain off. You switch your brain off, you die. So you're going to get that drain on your energy constantly, all the time. And if you're in an environment where you really want to conserve energy because, because you haven't got much food, for example, then having a big brain is a really, really stupid thing to do. Also, brains take a long time to grow. Not just grow in the womb, but also to develop and of course to fill up with information. There's no point in having a big brain that's going to fill up with some information. Now, from an evolutionary point of view, that's a dumb idea. Because from an evolutionary point of view, actually from another point of view as well, if you see it that way, you want to get to reproduction early, quickly. Because that's what it's all about. If you're not reproducing, you're wasting your time. And spending all this time, these long juvenile periods, this long period of reproduction, because we have these big brains, is very, very, very silly. Also, well, because it's grown, it's kind of grown up like a light bulb, but it's, and our skulls become thinner and less protective. So, with your average person, one stout whack with a tire line and they're dead. Now, you do that to a pig or a similarly sized animal, or he's not going to be best pleased, but he's not going to die. So, it's very risky to keep this very important organ in such a, well, a shoebox, essentially. So, so, really, it's a very dumb idea to grow a big brain unless you've got a good use for it. But quite clearly, the good use for it wasn't producing technology, wasn't producing art, wasn't producing all these, these amazing features that we call modern human behavior. And so it leads us to some questions. Why did we evolve those big brains if it wasn't to do the kind of technologies that we are so impressed with today and 50,000 years ago? And why isn't it related to brain size? And why have these big brains? Okay, and also, why did these technologies appear in different places around the world at different times, but not when we appeared 
in those places. Well, of course, the world of the mother's got some opinion about why, um, why this is. I mean, uh, many people argue that we might have evolved some brain genes or something like that. We become clever or we rewire wire our brain or something like that. And of course, also cultural advances are important, like being able to cooperate in larger groups. Or maybe language. Of course, language you can see is both biological and cultural. And in the last, well, the last two million years, um, it's been a pretty rough time as well. It's like a period called the Pleistocene. And climate change has been like that. I mean, it's been a real roller coaster of a ride. And so you could argue that developing technologies was a way of riding out that, of, of buffering ourselves, if you like, against the, the ups and downs of the climate we live in. But I'm going to argue for something else. I'm going to argue that it's nothing to do with those. That the appearance of this modern behaviour that we see today, that we all, we all reap the rewards of today, is actually really just down to population size and down to demography, down to interaction, down to how we interact with each other. Now, to, do, to look at this, we, we're going to treat culture or learning, things that we learn from our parental generations, as something as a similar kind of evolutionary system to genetic evolution. Okay? We, we have ideas, we have skills, we transmit them to the next generation. Some of them survive, some of them don't survive. Okay, so that's, you, in there you have all the ingredients for an evolutionary process. Now, if that's the case, then we can model that. We can actually model it, simulate it in a computer. So we tried to do that, and we tried to ask, if we have populations living close together, do they accumulate more culture, more skills, more technologies, or can they maintain more skills and technologies than if they're more dispersed? And we simulated that under various different conditions. And what you can see here is high population density and low population density. You can see the kind of white heat of technology here forming in areas where you have high population density, or when people interact more, or they migrate more. So, at least in theory, Theory. In, in theory, we can show that living together in tight communities or interacting more or exchanging ideas more is going to lead to the accumulation of more skills and more technologies and more know-how and more culture. So then we can ask, okay, so in theory that works, but does it really explain what we see in the archaeological record? Does it really explain these explosions in technology, including things like the invention of art? And so on. Well, one way to do that is to actually use genetics to work out how big populations were in the past. And using some, uh, some genetic tricks, we're able to actually estimate population sizes and see how they've grown in the past. So we can ask, did that happen at the time when we see this modern human behavior appearing around 50 or so thousand years ago? And the answer is a very, 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 very definite yes. Very clearly. Clearly, populations started growing around the time we saw these technologies. And what's more, we can show that you get exactly the same population density in Africa when you see these technologies appear in Africa as you do in Europe, when you see the technologies appear in Europe, as you do in the Middle East, when you see these technologies appear in the Middle East, and so on. So it seems from this that what we can say now is that cultural sophistication reflects more human interaction than it does human intelligence. And one, one other way of seeing it, seeing it is the idea that successful innovation depends more, more uh, depends less on how clever you are than on how well connected you are. Perhaps seems just as relevant today as it was 50 or 100,000 years ago. But of course, this leaves us with a number of questions. So I'm just going to throw three up here um, before I finish. So if, if we had the brains to behave in a modern way, before we started behaving in a modern way, then we can't have evolved our brains to do that. Because evolution has no foresight, we can't see what's coming. And also, this is telling us that art, the first appearance of art, is more a consequence of copying and learning across generations than perhaps of anything internal. Now, in fact, Picasso said that good art is is copying, and great art is theft. Maybe he was more right than he ever realized. And perhaps a last little thought is, we know the population density is getting higher, but we also know the connectivity is getting greater. We're all connected into a big world through the internet, and 
Does that mean we're getting smarter? Well, I'm not sure. But anyway, I'll leave it there. So thank you.